Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to moderate the uh, Striker Symposium, which is the fourth uh, in the series of Masterclass. So I'm going to hand straight over to Dr. Brian Jankovic uh, for his presentation. Hello, my name is Brian Jankowitz, and I'm an Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the Cooper Neurological Institute in opulence, Camden, New Jersey. Today, I'll be talking about the treatment of bifurcation aneurysms. What does the data tell us? Here are my disclosure statements. The whole idea behind this talk arose from four unique devices being approved in the recent past within the US, all specifically for the treatment of wide neck and or bifurcation aneurysms, Webb, Elvis, Pulse Rider, and the Atlas Stent. And while these four devices certainly are not comprehensive when it comes to the devices available in the US or abroad to treat bifurcation aneurysms. I would propose that the strongest level of data really lie behind three of this, these devices, Atlas, Elvis, and Webb. So I want you to think of this as less of an endorsement for these products and more of a conversation based out of necessity, simply based on the best data that we have available to us. I think it's important to start by looking at what the primary effectiveness definition of these three trials that were FDA approved, industry sponsored within the US. Fortunately, we can draw a relatively meaningful comparison because the definition of success was the same in all three trials. 100% occlusion by DSA, core lab adjudicated, no retreatment within the first 12 months and no stenosis of the parent artery greater than 50%. And when you look at these numbers, I think you have to couch them from the perspective that even today, the established uh, references regarding the cure rates of endovascular treatment for bifurcation aneurysms is still being quoted as 30 to 50%. So all of these results stand in a marked contrast to past data really showing that endovascular treatment did quite poorly for wide neck and or bifurcation aneurysms. Here we have an 84% uh, durable treatment rate for Atlas, 70% for, El for Elvis, and 53% for Webb. Now it's hard to know what to make of these numbers, particularly when thinking about how to compare them to open surgical clipping. Well, the only data that I know to seek when it when I attempt to make a meaningful comparison with an open craniotomy for clipping is the ISAT data, the one-year radiographic outcomes from ISAT, from experienced operators in a core lab adjudicated data set. And the outcomes were not 100%. The complete occlusion rates for clipped aneurysms in ISAT only achieved 82%, which means that to my knowledge, the ATLAS trial was the first coil or stent coil based trial to show superior durable, complete occlusion rates for the treatment of intracranial aneurysms over that of an open craniotomy for clipping. But of course, we can't couch the results of these studies simply by their efficacy. We have to put safety in context. Uh, Elvis and Atlas showed a primary safety event rate of 4 to 5%, an event rate that I, I fully expected and one that I typically quote to my patients for the endovascular treatment of intracranial aneurysms. Webb, on the other hand, showed a remarkably low primary safety rate of 0.7%. Now, unfortunately, we cannot compare these safety event rates because each trial used a different definition of death or disabling stroke. For instance, Elvis took the long view and defined disabling stroke as an MRS of greater than three lasting for greater than three months. Atlas chose to pursue perhaps the most stringent criteria for a major stroke using what most stroke trials currently define as a major stroke as an increase in the NH stroke scale of four greater lasting for greater than 24 hours. And Webb perhaps took the most practical definition of a major stroke, defining their stroke rate as an NIH stroke scale of greater than four or equal to four, lasting for greater than seven days. Because we know that most neurological events that are procedural based tend to be minor and they tend to resolve after 24 to 48 hours. So I think it's worth doing a, a, a little bit uh, further explanation of these safety rates, once again, because you simply can't compare these published rates. For instance, 
Uh, it's true that most of the complications, uh, or at least periprocedural complications in the Weber trial were short-lived, but it is worth noting that 8% of the patients did suffer an ischemic or a hemorrhagic stroke, most of them once again being mild or, or resolving. On the flip side, of the eight patients that were adjudicated by the CEC in the ATLAS trial as having a major stroke, three of those patients walked out of the hospital at their neurological baseline with no lasting neurological sequela uh, because their symptoms resolved between 24 hours and seven days, uh, leading to a, an actual safety event rate of 2.7% in an alternate universe. And it is also interesting to note that of those five patients who did have a permanent neurological deficit, two of those patients suffered their incident well over 100 days beyond the procedure. So they were not procedure-related events because the FDA mandated that every neurologic event that happened within the first year after these trials were qualified as a major stroke. So the methodology is as such. The goal was to compare excellent quality data between trials. And, and I'm going to use ATLAS as a surrogate for all stent coiling trials, simply because it does constitute the largest data set available by well over 100 patients over the over the other highest enrolling stent coiling trial. And Webb simply has the largest uh, amount of data for any intrasacular device worldwide. So the goal was to take core lab adjudicated data to compare stent coiling and an intrasacular device and really look at the most objective outcomes that we could possibly evaluate, that being primary occlusion rates and Ramond 1 worsening, because once again, this was DSA, core lab adjudicated at 12 months. And we also chose to look at retreatment rates. Uh, we only took the ATLAS patients that met inclusion criteria to the Webb trial to really attempt to procure an apples to apples comparisons. And we had a robust data set, 127 ATLAS patients that could have been enrolled in the Webb trial. And just to prove that these were similar patients, uh, they, were, or they were by and large healthy and normal patients with a low MRS and, and uh, NH stroke scale typically of zero at baseline. We could even control for aneurysm location, aneurysm size, and dome to neck ratio, which were all nearly identical, once again, between this ATLAS cohort and the patients in the Webb trial. And with that, when we looked at the final DSA, Ramond 1 occlusion rates, once again, core lab adjudicated, the ATLAS patients had a 90%, 100% occlusion rate. The Webbit patients had a 54%, 100% occlusion rate. And there were so many patients that we could take a more granular approach to sifting through this data. For instance, we could look at specific aneurysm location. Uh, for instance, in the Webbit trial, it didn't surprise me that intrasacular devices may suffer at the MCA bifurcation, typically because the, the branching vessels are not in plane. And that means we could actually take ATLAS patients or stent coiled patients, specify them by location and compare them to intrasacular device treatments by location. And we can see that while intrasacular devices, once again, they, they may provide lower durable occlusion rates, particularly at the MCA bifurcation and NACOM, it does seem that stent coiling constructs seem to hold up with regards to complete occlusion across the full spectrum of aneurysm location. The whole goal being that we want to provide individualized uh, treatment for every specific aneurysm. It wouldn't surprise me that over time, if we see markedly improved uh, durable outcomes for basilar apex aneurysms and ICA terminuses, particularly with intrasacular devices. Uh, when looking at angiographic recanalization or, or retreatment, once again, somewhat uh, subjective, uh, the Webb trial showed a 15% necessity of retreatment or angiographic recanalization atlas patients, 7.9%. And when looking at Ramond 1 recanalization, basically any worsening after 100% occlusion noted by core lab at the, at the end of the, of the primary procedure, Webb showed 11.5% worsening, Atlas 6.5%. And then finally, retreatment rates, once again, wildly uh, subjective, Webb 9.8% and Atlas 3.1%. So we've gone from industry-sponsored uh, trials within the U.S. with FDA oversight, and now we'll transition to the largest prospective studies in Europe, and then we'll move on to uh, large uh, meta-analyses, and finally to some of the most recent retrospective reviews.
So these large prospective registries in Europe, uh, typified by French Observatory, Webcast 1 and Webcast 2. My takeaway is that while uh, intrasecular devices such as web are still showing uh, excellent safety rates, one thing to, that we need to keep an eye on are the, still the concerningly high rate of thromboembolic events. Once again, mostly mild, most of the patients completely uh, recover from these events, but still concerningly high. And we have yet to see an excellent study show a complete occlusion rate from a, a web device, utilizing the web device uh, with uh, occlusion rates cresting 56 to 60%. I was uh, heartened by what I thought might be a, a general reduction in the use of adjunctive devices for treatment. However, some recent retrospective data uh, may disprove that. Finally, on to some of the largest meta-analyses uh, available worldwide. Calms Group in Rochester evaluated 565 patients, and the Beijing Group looked at 935 patients over the past few years. I think still a, a quite an acceptable uh, permanent morbidity and mortality rate of 3 to 4%. We're seeing uh, uh, overall a slight reduction in the thromboembolic events now below 10%, but still complete occlusion rates from 39 to 55%. And, and granted, Many of these patients uh, exhibited disparate aneurysms, and some of them were ruptured, still have yet to see uh, a, a significant uptick in the complete occlusion rates that I'd hoped for. Now, while many uh, publications have moved towards adequate occlusion rates, and I am happy to eventually adopt that as an adequate definition of occlusion. However, I think that we're still waiting for long-term data to really support that, and I, I greatly look forward to the five-year outcomes from the Webbit trial. Unfortunately, adjunctive devices and retreatment rates were simply not disclosed in these large systematic reviews. And finally, on to the most recent retrospective analyses bringing us in uh, to 2018, 19, and 20. Once again, most of these reporting adequate occlusion rates, which I'm just not ready to consider adequate, uh, although I look forward to data to, to actually support that. I think uh, my takeaway from these more recent studies is that now looking at a composite of well over 300 patients, there is a significant number of these devices, even in the hands of the most experienced operators, primarily throughout Europe, still using adjunctive devices either uh, during the initial treatment or for the treatment of, of recanalization after placement of a web. So nearly one in five web devices implanted in Europe uh, may ultimately require an adjunctive device either for the primary treatment or uh, to treat residual and or recurrence. And while we have decent data to show that recoiling an, an aneurysm that has been primarily coiled or stent coiled is relatively safe and barely increases the cumulative permanent morbidity and mortality, what we don't know is the added cumulative morbidity and mortality when needing to rely on more complicated salvage techniques, such as adding a stent to a, an intrasecular device or a flow diverter. And this is something that we're gonna have to follow very closely in the following years. Uh, I can point to two large retrospective analyses for stent coiling. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, retrospective reviews using the ELVA stent to treat aneurysms, 384 patients, complete occlusion rates of 84.3% and a permanent m, &M of 1.4%, thromboembolic rates of 4.9%, really showing that the real world experience uh, using the ELVA stent uh, paralleled very closely to the well-controlled trials. And I would say the same is true for ATLAS. In 128 patients across 11 sites, complete occlusion rates, uh, post-market surveillance well, done well after the ATLAS trial, 76%, 100% uh, occlusion rates uh, with a permanent m, &M of 3.1% thromboembolic event rate of 4.7%, once again, showing that the real world experience with stent coiling really closely mimics the data that I, I presented previously in, uh, in the industry-sponsored FDA oversight uh, trials. And finally, just to, as a nod to point out that I, I think that a significant number of bifurcation aneurysms have, are, and will be flow diverted. Uh, many of you have undertaken this treatment paradigm. And some of you even have, sh have commented that it might not be the best option for the treatment of bifurcation aneurysms. I don't think we, we have any meaningful data with which to make a relevant comparison. So I'll do my best and I'll leave you with this.
under the best of circumstances, which I think is highlighted in the premier trial, which were, I think, which was really a trial designed to show the impressive safety and efficacy of flow diversion for well-selected aneurysms. So these are aneurysms that could be on the ICA or the vertebral artery. However, over 95% were on the ICA. Mean aneurysm size was five millimeters, sidewall aneurysms. If you wanna try and compare the optimal flow diverted aneurysm to stent coiling, I think the data shows because they have the, the same primary effectiveness definitions that stent coiling is equivalent to, if not superior, 84% compared to 76% of flow diverting the most straightforward aneurysms. And if you wanna uh, take a more apples to apples comparisons, we actually took only the Atlas patients that met premier inclusion criteria and looked only at the primary effectiveness outcome definition. And once again showed stent coiling is equivalent to or superior to flow diversion. And if you just wanna look at 100% occlusion rates at 12 months by catheter-based angiography, once again, stent coiling is equivalent to, if not superior. And yes, if you, when you look at the two or three year follow-ups of Premier and flow diversion, I suspect those 100% occlusion rates will increase. Based on the data that we have, stent coiling's not going anywhere. I'll leave you with this. This was a slide that was shown to the FDA to prove that even with Elvis, Atlas, Pulse Rider, we still needed other devices within the US to treat wide neck bifurcation aneurysms. There was still an unmet, an unmet need. Something that could be used endovascular that would approach the, the efficacy of surgical clipping that was less invasive. And that really uh, allowed Webb to be brought into the US. I think that we still have more work to be done to show that it's, it's durable occlusion uh, is worth it. Uh, I think that we have shown that it is quite a safe device although we will need to prove that, that for those patients that need to be salvaged or retreated, that the cumulative morbidity uh, is still quite low. And I, I'm very happy to say that for the first time, we've actually shown endovascular treatment that has surpassed surgical clipping efficacy. And I hope that data continues to support, uh, to support that. Uh, I'm an eternal, eternal, I am an eternal optimist, uh, so I'm always looking for ways that we can improve our ability to apply these devices. I think that as we accumulate a history or track record of treating hundreds, if not thousands of patients, uh, we can start tailoring treatment to specific aneurysms or patients. So this classification system uh, try, uh, attempted to help us determine which aneurysms might be optimally treated with stent coiling or which might uh, lead to high recanalization rates. For instance, it appears that the MCA and ACOM uh, location are particularly suited for stent coiling, whereas ICA or, or basilar tip aneurysms uh, exhibited high rates of recanalization. And finally, uh, the most recent articles really attempting to standardize or protocolize intrasacular treatment, which I have no doubt will lead to increasing safety and much higher efficacy. In conclusion, meaningful comparisons can be made between studies and devices. However, device innovation and thoughtful retrospective analysis will ultimately improve our radiographic outcomes and safety uh, across all devices available in the US and beyond. However, we ultimately will need to prove that this translates into clinically measurable benefits for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jankovic. Hi, You're we've welcome. got a few minutes uh, for some questions now. Um, so you've got quite a few questions in the chat. Some of them are, are somewhat answered, but we'll, we'll go through them. So is there a correlation between the neck remnants and long-term results? So occlusion stability. I would say that for coiling, certainly. Uh, and there's every reason to believe that coil, whether you coil or stent coil, uh, any residual aneurysm, leads to a higher chance of recanalization and delayed regrowth. I suspect the same will hold true for intrasacular devices such as web. Uh, the, the data shows that uh, whether you have 100% occlusion or aneurysmal remnant, that, that particularly for intrasacular devices, you can see uh, a significant rate of recanalization, which still worries me. I think the data is a little stronger for coiling or stent coiling constructs that when you see an initial 100% occlusion that the recanalization rates uh, or the, the long-term likelihood of seeing any recanalization is significantly lower. Uh, 
Uh, but I think regardless of the, the device, all evidence to date points to the fact that any amount of contrast within the aneurysm uh, at any time point after the initial treatment uh, does lead to a higher rate of recurrence and potentially the need for retreatment. Okay, thank you. So therefore, is Web truly a one and done device? I think it can be in appropriately selected patients. Uh, it worries me though that the cases that lead to the highest rate of initial and permanent 100% occlusion happen to be those patients or those aneurysms that are the most straightforward to treat by whatever means you choose, whether that's clipping or coiling alone or balloon remodeling or stent coiling. For instance, it wouldn't surprise me if the, the most consistent one and done intrasacular treatments are going to be narrow neck PCOM aneurysms or narrow neck ophthalmic artery aneurysms as opposed to the types of aneurysms it was purportedly designed to treat. Uh, I would say the data doesn't support that currently uh, now that we have up to three year outcomes for, for many of the European trials such as webcast. Uh, where we're seeing still a, a plateau of about a 50%, 100% occlusion rate uh, out to three years, and still uh, some recanalization uh, up to 10% uh, beyond a year. Uh, so can it be a one and done? Sure. Uh, I think we'll see an, an increasing uh, percent of those over time with increased experience and improved devices, but, uh, but we're only seeing that about, with the flip of a coin, about 50% of the time nowadays. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we assume the same data interpretation for acute settings? Uh, so this um, for, is with regard to using web for acutes uh, to avoid rebleeding. I don't think we know. I simply don't mm -hmm. think there's enough data regarding ruptured aneurysms, uh, quite honestly, for any endovascular treatment. Uh, I think that it is very difficult to correlate the efficacy of treatment between uh, unruptured and ruptured aneurysms. Mm -hmm. I, just, I think it's too early to tell, and, and my fear is we probably will never know because I'm concerned we won't have great data regarding ruptured aneurysms. I do worry, though, that, that if we see a, approximately a 50%, 100% occlusion rate for intrasacular devices now, with the majority of those being elective unruptured patients, that it, it stands to reason that the results will, will only be worse for ruptured aneurysms. And I think in that cohort, we're gonna see an extremely high rate of recurrence and especially need for retreatment. Okay, so on that topic, what's the difference between Raymond scale one and complete occlusion on the web occlusion scale? Well, uh, the Webbit defined it as the ability to still have a small amount of contrast in the marker recess, the little button at the proximal end yeah. of the web device. Uh, and even with that small amount of contrast opacification, you can still define it as uh, complete occlusion. I actually think that is probably reasonable. However, I think it is a bit premature to define it as complete occlusion. I think that we need data to support that. And if the European results are any metric, uh, we have seen up to a 10% recanalization rate, even after 100% occlusion deemed by uh, CoreLab adjudicated uh, DSA evaluation at the end of both European and American trials. Uh, so I, I, I do think we need more data to ensure that uh, even a small amount of contrast filling at the, at the marker recess uh, is indeed uh, correlates or does indeed correlate with 100% occlusion as we've defined for coiling for over a decade. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question. Web safety data looks excellent. Is this accurate? Well, uh, I think, I believe the data that they, that was presented. I do think it it's all in the eye of the beholder. I think there are different ways to parse out the data. Uh, in my talk, I talked about how you define your safety outcomes is extremely important. And when you carefully review trials, I think you have to uh, keep a close eye on how safety events are defined. I think that web is a safe device. Uh, 
I suspect that if you use the uh, exact same definitions of safety, that it would be equivalently safety uh, or that stent coiling would show equivalent safety to intrasacular devices. I also am concerned about the thromboembolic complication rates, which are often either not reported, underreported, or quite honestly, very difficult to capture outside of rigorous prospective trials. It stands to reason when you have a, a high mesh density uh, interest or endovascular product hanging out into the apparent vessel that you will have thromboembolic complications. And it doesn't surprise me that that rate is still anywhere from eight to 20% across the board through all published articles uh, in, in Europe and the USA. So I do think it's a safe device, but I, I think that there is a, a, a substantial, particularly thromboembolic complication rate. Most patients recover, most patients in the Alonkom do well, but that's still a, a brain injury no matter how you dice it. Okay, thank you. Um, and the final question in the chat is, how does the long-term durability of web compare to Atlas? I think that the recanalization rates of web after one year are, are consistently reported at about 10%. It's hard to know if those will become significant, if those will ultimately require retreatment. The recanalization rate beyond a year after stent coiling with Atlas uh, is largely unknown. Uh, I don't think we have great data to, uh, to evaluate that. Uh, when we do our post uh, hoc analysis or, or follow up to the Atlas trial, I think we'll have much more, much more granular data regarding that. Uh, I do think though that we have excellent evidence from the, our decades of coiling that it stands to reason that 100% occlusion at a year after coiling or stent coiling will be a permanent or durable result. And we just don't have that type of data for intrasacular devices. Okay, great, thank you. Um, last question with regards to Atlas that I have here is, um, although it's a great stent in lots of ways, it's a bit less visible than some of the uh, alternatives, especially the alternatives that are using DFT technology. Um, how would you speak to that? Has that been a drawback in your practice? I agree that the, the visibility and, and the lack of resheathability are, are the two downsides to most laser cut night and all stents, uh, particularly Atlas. I, in, in my mind, that of all the stents currently on the market, I think they're all comparably visible. So I don't think that that any micro stent in Europe or the, the US is significantly more visible than Atlas. Uh, I find that the the ease, particularly of laser cut night and all stents, uh, is is worth the reduced visualization. And as long as you can see the, the distal and proximal stent tines, I feel very comfortable with its placement. And also now, as, as the prior masterclass showed, with the ability to do dynasty T's, you can visualize the stents quite or in an excellent fashion uh, with with a dynasty T, uh, regardless of the visualization uh, during immediate implantation. But it, it has not been a drawback because the ease of implantation uh, far outweighs any concerns about visualization. Great, thank you. We just have a minute. Do you have any uh, conclu concluding comments? Well, I, I just want to. Uh, reference the prior master class, and I think that it was a great example of of choosing devices that are simple uh, and easy to use, and and uh, there's a consistency to them. For instance, in the last class, they talked about not having the appropriate intrasacular device for a given aneurysm, and then they had to fall back on on Y stent constructs uh, for treating an aneurysm. I think to myself, as I grow comfortable using really the same size atlas for almost every case, because I, it's very, I've grown very comfortable oversizing an atlas in really all locations, I've got it down to, I only use one or two different sizes. And the ability to use a single device across really all anatomic locations, I think, has far-reaching implications. So for me, it's about leaving as little metal left behind in the vessel and keeping it as simple as possible. Thank you. Great session. Thank you so much.